to God. All right, we're on a new series. Well, I say a new series. I heard you, baby. That's a good word. <laughs> Amen. There you go, Dad. Bless their little hearts. That's something else. That's our future, by the way. That's the leaders. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. We're in a series. Uh, we have been for the last uh, couple of weeks. This is the third message in the series, and I've warned you guys that there are about 11 of these, so, uh, you know, it, it, it will be a quite a few observations by the time we get to the end. And uh, we've, been, we've been looking at some of the great stories and miracles of Jesus and looking at what the Word says about him and, and what, it's, it, what he did and how he acted and how the disciples responded and what he was trying to teach and, and show us about following him. Because we all, at times, make the statement, well, we just simply want to follow Jesus. Well, if we do, then there are going to be some things that are going to be... Um, expected of us and some things the Lord tried to teach us so that we can be, so that we can follow him in some very fruitful ways. And we look first, the first week at the great story and miracle of the woman at the well. And in that, we had some observations like, if you follow, if you're following Jesus, you're often going to be walking towards something that you would rather avoid and that you would be walking towards something that you don't understand or that you might have to expand your understanding of the vastness of God's love to walk with Jesus and understand that he loves everyone and he walks uh, with us and, and uh, he loves the Samaritans as much as the Jews and he loves all those people that we somehow can um, uh, expedite from our relationships and so forth. Anyway, you have, to under, you have to get a grasp that God, his love is so vast that it includes everyone uh, and he loves them just like he loves us. And then we looked last week at the feeding of the 5,000 and in the feeding of the 5,000, um, you, we learned several uh, things that we have to periodically uh, get way, get back, step back, or we'll eventually give up. We just get overwhelmed. We get worn out. So you have to just plan and strategize that. And that you have to work through personal pain and then uh, offer what you have now. And by the way, uh, and some of you guys that are out here watching uh, now sent in um, uh, quite several, several notices this week and notes about how God blessed them in, in the last part of that where I encourage everybody, just give, give what you have now. In other words, you're only. Just take whatever that is. I only have a minute. I only have five minutes. I only have ten dollars. Only whatever your limitation of your only is, just give it to him and see what he'll do with that. Now today we're going to be looking at um, a whole chapter actually that tells a tremendous, gives a tremendous insight into uh, a time very shortly, a couple of weeks after the resurrection. It's in John 21, and in in John 21, just to give you just a little bit of context, context, because this was only a couple of weeks after the resurrection, these were strange times. Jesus was popping in and popping out all, all the time. He, he would be there and then he would be gone. Uh, Mary Magdalene was the first one to see Jesus after the resurrection. You know, she went to the garden to, uh, to anoint him. And when she got there, uh, the angel said, hey, he's not here. He's gone. Uh, don't seek the living among the dead. He's risen, like he said. And then she hears a voice. I, uh, I mean, to me, evidently, it must be behind her. She's not looking at, at, at the voice. The voice comes from behind her and, and begins to say something to her. And she thinks that it's the gardener that's talking to her. And then when she turns and she sees that it's Jesus, uh, of course, you know, she recognizes. And he says, you know, when he says her name, she recognizes him. And he tells her to go back and tell the disciples what she she's encountered that he's alive. This is on the day of his resurrection. And then just a, a short time later, some other women come to the tomb, uh, Joanna and Mary, the mother of James and uh, Salome, uh, Salome and several other women. And he tells them to do the same thing. And they go back and report to the disciples on the same day. There are two disciples going down the road to Emmaus. And they're sad, and they're walking, and they're saying, well, we had hoped he would have been the one to bring deliverance, but uh, our hope is gone. It's in the past tense. Uh, and then Jesus comes and joins them walking down the road, and they don't recognize that it's Jesus, which tells us what about the resurrected Jesus? That all of our resurrection bodies are going to be different, right? 
that uh, even though it's Jesus and he's physically there, I mean, he's not a ghost, he's not an image, he is physically there, they don't recognize him, which is amazing to me. So there must be something unique about our, about our glorified body. But anyway, as he walks and talks with them down the road, they're sad because they thought he would have been the one to have delivered Israel. But um, he finally gets to a place where they stop to eat and then he begins to break bread. And when they see the scars in his hands, uh, they recognize that it's him. And they're encouraged to go back and tell the disciples what they saw, and they do, but it seems that the disciples are really not convinced yet that he's actually, all of this is actually true. Then Peter, the next day, Peter sees uh, Jesus appears to Peter, and Peter then tells the disciples, and they say, okay, uh, it must be true. About a week later, the disciples are in a room in Jerusalem, and Thomas is not there, one of the disciples, and Jesus just walks through the walls. And he stands right there in the midst of them. And then uh, they tell Thomas, and Thomas says, I don't believe that. You know? And then Thomas is in the room, and Jesus appears through there, and he tells him, hey, put your fingers in the nail hole. Put your hand in the side here. Do you have anything to eat, is what he asks him to do. Because uh, he wants to prove, hey, I'm not a ghost, I'm not a vision, I'm not an image. I'm really alive, just like I said. Well, these were the strange times that John 21 comes about in. Now, we're going to begin reading at verse 1, uh, John 21, and here it is. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. By the way, let me just mention this about these titles for the Sea of Galilee. There, there are basically four titles that the Sea of Galilee has. One of them is the Sea of Tiberias. And so it, it, this, is the, this is the Sea of Galilee. And so he's on there on the Sea of Galilee. And, and here, verse 2, who's there? Simon Peter's there. Thomas called the twin. Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee. The sons of Zebedee, James and John. By the way, John that pins this gospel, this is him and his brother. And two others of his disciples were together. Now, I've always been interested in that two others. They're nameless. Um, I take the opportunity to, to, to say when I read this passage, uh, let's, just, let's just assign the seed of the two others to you and I. Let's just say the Holy Spirit wants us to understand what's happening in this. So the two other disciples there, let's just say they're us. Now, verse, uh, verse 3, Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. Now, this might seem to be like a, a, an innocent comment that Peter is making, but um, nobody would blame the disciples for wanting to go fishing after the, 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 the few weeks that they've experienced and all of the anxiety and frustration and fear and all of those kinds. Nobody would blame you for wanting to go fishing. But uh, Peter's very discouraged. Uh, you remember one of the last things that happened to Peter was uh, Peter said... Uh, the rest of this bunch might forsake you, but I'll never forsake you, and this can never happen to you. He said things like that, and Jesus said, Peter, before the rooster crows in the morning, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter says, no, 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 no. Well, that's exactly what happened. And he not only denied knowing him three times, he did it before uh, a teenage girl. And then, he, and then he cursed at the teenage girl. This had to be a super low point in Peter's life, I'm thinking. Well, he's out there and he's very discouraged. And, and now he's simply saying, uh, hey guys, I'm obviously a failure as a disciple. Maybe I can, you know, I am a fisherman. Maybe I can go back to the fishing business and, and pick my life up again. So basically what Peter is doing here, Peter is basically saying, I'm quitting the ministry. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going back fishing. I'm going back to what I used to do in life, and, and, and maybe I can be successful in that. And then six other disciples say to him, in, in, in the remainder of that verse, they said to him, well, we're going, we, we're going with you also. So this great influence Peter has over all these men, and they're now, now six of them are saying, hey, well, I guess we'll go back into business with you because, I mean, we obviously can't be the good disciples. And they went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. 
So he, he, they walk with him for three and a half years, and he's standing on the shore. They're not very far. You'll hear in just a minute. They're about uh, they're about two hundred cubits, which a cubit is about uh, about a yard and a half. So they're about three hundred yards, about a football field without the end zones away from the shore. So that's not very far. And they see Jesus, but they don't recognize that it's Jesus. So obviously, there's something different about this glorified body, and. Um, and, uh, and, and they spent that night fishing and they caught nothing. But when morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, do you have any food? They answered, no. I mean, you, you fishermen can kind of identify with this, right? Uh, you love to tell people when they say, hey, how would you catch? No, no, no. Yeah, <laughs> well, I didn't catch, the fish weren't biting, uh, you know, anyway, so there, you know, it, it's a discouraging thing, have you caught anything, and, and Jesus, and they said, no, and then verse six, and he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some, so they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish, therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, this is John, talking about himself in third person now. Matter of fact, he, in the Gospel of John, he never mentions himself by name. He does in the book of Revelation because he's testifying to some things, but he, he, just, he just calls himself that disciple that Jesus loved. So that's talking about John. So John says to Peter, uh, verse seven, it's the Lord. <laughs> I mean, he, that, it, had to be, it, it, it had to throw him into remembrance when he said, cast the net on the other right side of the boat. And then that had happened before, by the way. So, it, you know, this is just a, a setup, really, is what it is. Jesus set him up. It's the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, this is some news he needed, by the way, because when, as soon as he heard it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. Um, one of the translations, the old King James Version, said that Peter was naked sitting in a boat. Uh, most likely, I mean, this really uh, describes it pretty good, I think. You know, you had an outer guard, and then you got your little skivvies on underneath. <laughs> underneath. So Peter's sitting there in his skivvies in the boat. I mean, there's nothing but men out there. So, I mean, it's not like some kind of weirdo. But anyway, he doesn't want to see Jesus with just his skivvies, evidently. So he throws on his outer garment, and he plunges into the sea. So he's, he's got to get there before the rest of them. Now, this is a unique thing. But the other disciples came in a little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 200 cubits, uh, dragging the net of fish. So, you know, the question obviously becomes, well, why did Peter jump in? Why didn't he just wait for the rest of them and just ride in with the rest? They weren't very far. Uh, well, obviously. I mean, have any of you ever disappointed someone so badly that you felt the next time you saw them, they were certainly going to have something to say to you about this? I think this is what happened to Peter. I think Peter basically said, well, you know, the last time I talked to Jesus, I was telling him I was going to stand up for him and I failed him and denied him. And so, so I know that Jesus is going to have some stuff to say to me and I don't want the rest of these guys to hear what he has to say to me. So I'm going to beat them in and hopefully Jesus will tell me before they get in there so I don't have to be embarrassed in front of all these guys. Um, verse 9 then, as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. Now, this is another setup. Uh, just to understand what kind of fire this is. You know, there are all types of fire. There's fire with little twigs, fire with, you know, nice logs. There's fire from rags. There's fire from paper. Uh, all kind of fire. This fire, this word that's used here is anthrakia, which means a charcoal fire. How many of you have ever smelled a charcoal fire in your neighborhood and you said, immediately you smelled it and said, hey, somebody's barbecuing, right? Because charcoal has such a distinctive smell. It's, it, it, it's impossible to miss the smell of a charcoal fire, of course, if you, unless you have COVID. But, uh, but anyway, uh, it's charcoal. Now, just to give you an idea why this is a setup is because the only other place in the Bible that describes a charcoal fire, anthrakia, is the fire that Peter warmed his hands 
verse 2, on the night that he betrayed Jesus, he and the little girl were standing around the fire. It was a charcoal fire. So you know it just through, as soon as he got to the land and swam in, he's breathing hard. First thing that hits him is a smell of that charcoal fire. That had to be, you know, uh, bring back some memories. And so here he is, and he's all anticipating what's going to happen. And Jesus said, well, uh, Bring some of the fish which you've just caught. Simon Peter went up and he dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. That, that's amazing. In the presence of the glorified Lord, somebody took time to count the fish. <laughs> you know, and it's not an estimate. Like, well, that's about 150 fish. No, it's 153 fish. I counted them. All right. Um, and although there were so many, the net was not yet broken. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast, which means Jesus is pro-breakfast. And, you know, it is an important meal of the day. So he said, all right, before we get into anything, come on over here. Let me, let me give you something to eat. You guys need to settle down. Yet none of the disciples dare ask him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord? Uh, Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them and likewise the fish. Now, this should have caused some flashbacks, right? Last week, you know, we looked at the feeding of the 5,000 and this is what he did. He broke the bread and he gave it to them and then they began to hand it out and just miraculous, super miraculous thing. The bread just never ran out. They picked up 12 baskets full left over. So this had to be something that would cause some things to turn. Verse 14, this is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. First time Thomas wasn't there, second time Thomas was there. This is the third time where a whole group of disciples get to see him all at one time. Uh, so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Now I'm going to talk about the play on words here, and the play on words is the whole message of, of this little section. It, it, if, you don't, if you don't understand the, the play on words that's happening here between Peter and Jesus, you, you miss the whole point of the whole thing. And, and so I'll share that with you in just a moment. Let me just read through. And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said it to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things and you know I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Good little interaction. Verse 18, next words Jesus speaks to Peter. Most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished, and when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This has to be the lousiest sales pitch in the history of the world, right? This he spoke signifying by what death he should glorify God. Now notice that it doesn't say by what death he might die. It says by what death he might glorify God. So you'll see in a moment that um, there's, a, there's some action playing on that. I'll, I'll, when I get to it, I'll, I'll mention it. Uh, and when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. All right, I just told you that if you follow me, some people are going to do some bad stuff to you, and you're not going to be able to control what happens to you. But knowing this, follow me. Okay, good sales pitch. Wonderful. That, that wouldn't work at the lot. <laughs> I don't think so. Verse 20. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. Who is that, by the way? John. Here's John. Peter's most likely the oldest disciple. He, he's probably maybe middle, uh, low to middle 20s. John's probably about 15 years old. He's the youngest. Peter's the oldest. Peter, Jesus just told Peter, you're going to die if you follow me. And, and, and then John is following at a distance. Uh, he's, not, he's not right there in the conversation. He's not eavesdropping. He's not, I mean, John, these were strange days. You never knew when the last time you might see Jesus. And so here's John, who loves Jesus, following at a distance, 
trying to just keep within eye distance of him because who knows, this might be the last time you see Jesus. By the time, I mean, he may never come back from this conversation. He may just be vanished and just be gone. That was the kind of day it was. So John's following at a distance. Now that's just like John. John, John wouldn't butt in. He was very humble, very all that. That's just like John. Peter sees John following at a distance who had also leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, uh, who, is the, who is the one that betrays you? And, and I think that that little statement right there, which uh, John throws into his writing, is basically just shows you how human John is. Everybody wants to be significant, right? I mean, you want to, you want to feel that you're part of, of the importance of an event. And so here's John saying, oh, and by the way, I'm, I'm not only the one that Jesus loves, but I'm also the one who had his head laying on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper saying, is it me who's going to betray you? He, he just wants you to know that he had a big role to play in that and that he was part of all that stuff. I, that's just humanity, I, I think. I may be totally wrong, but that's, don't say that to Jesus when you get to heaven, but that's, that's what I'm saying. Verse 21, Peter seeing him. Now, this is just like Peter. <laughs> Peter seeing him said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? <laughs> he sees John, he said, you just told me that I'm going to die if I follow you. Hey, what, what about this man? In other words, Jesus is basically looking at Jesus and saying, it's not fair, right? Uh, if I follow you, I'm going to die. And, 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 and if he follows you, what's going to happen to him? You know, we're such strange creatures, aren't we? we? We just have this way of being secretly happy if we get blessed more than anybody else gets blessed. And we just have this way of kind of being uh, concerned about that as if somehow everything needed to be fair. Notice Peter here, I think, gets a real quick prayer life. And you know what his prayer is? Hey, God, raw deal. I'm getting a raw deal. You know, you said I'm going to die. Uh, I've given my life for you, and what do I get? Nothing. I've done all this for you, and what do I get? Nothing. Anyway, so he's complaining about that. Verse 22, Jesus said to him, if I will that he remains till I come, what is that to you? Now, get the picture at this point, meek, mild, compassionate, always appropriate Jesus had an opportunity to let Peter down a little bit easy. Uh, so to speak, talk him off the ledge. But he looks at Jesus, he looks at Peter and he says, Peter, you're going down and you're going down hard. And if I want him to have a happily ever after life, what is that to you? Let me take just a, a shot at, at what, it, what is that to Peter. Peter's, Peter is, is a human, and he has a friend whose name is John. And the reason Peter's so upset about this is because Peter is, is basically saying, look, I have to die, and he gets to live forever? I mean, Jesus, you know, that's, that's, not, that's not fair at all. So... What can we draw from that? That basically is that if you're looking for fairness, Jesus might not be your man. And earth probably not your planet either because things happen all the time on earth that are not fair at all. But here's Peter and he's, this is his objection. This is not, you said I would die and he's not. He's gonna live forever. Verse 23, then this saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die, which tells you they had trouble with gossip too. All right, it went out, hey, Jesus said he wasn't ever going to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die. But if I will that he remains till I come, what is that to you? He didn't say John was going to live. He said, if I wanted that to happen, what would that, why, why, should that, why should you be concerned with that? That has nothing to do with you. Verse 24, this is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Verse 25, great verse. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen.
so be it. Let it be done. All right, three more observations from this concerning following Jesus. First observation, we are following a person, not an idea. Peter had chucked the experience of following Jesus in as a bad experiment, a, a bad experience in life. He was the unofficial spokesman, by the way, of the disciples, and, and, the, uh, <laughs> and he considered himself to be a leader of the disciples. Every time Jesus asked the disciples a question, it was always Peter that answered the question. He just jumped in before anybody else could answer the question. And almost everything Peter said in the Gospels was wrong. Let's build three tabernacles. This will never happen to you. The rest of this bunch might forsake you, but you can, you can count on the rock. And all he ever did was deny Jesus three times before the little girl, before the rooster crowed. So almost everything he said in the gospel was wrong. There was only one time Peter got it right, and that was when Jesus asked the disciples, uh, who do these people say that I am? And the other disciples began to say things like, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, some say you're Jeremiah. Others might say that you're one of the other prophets. And then Peter, the only time he ever said anything right, said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus immediately looked at Peter and said, you know why you got that right? Because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but only my Father, which is in heaven, which was Jesus' way of saying, the reason you got this right is because the Spirit answered for you before your flesh had time to get up and say anything. So Peter was the, uh, Peter was the leader of the disciples, and Peter had led the disciples away from the call as if somehow the ministry that Jesus had called them to and prepared them for was some kind of grand idea that had failed. And so Jesus confronts Peter. And you know how Jesus confronts Peter? Peter's thinking, or treating this as if it's just, it's a plan that didn't work out. So, hey, I'm going back to the fishing business. I thought it'd work out, but it didn't. As if it were some grand illusion, grand idea that they could just step back away from. So here's what Jesus did. Jesus confronted Peter personally about his love, not for a plan or an idea, but his love for a person, the person of Jesus. So let's just look at that real quick. In uh, verse 15, I told you a moment ago, I'd share with you the, the, the play on words here. All right. Uh, the English language is a, is, is a very poor language in many ways. And the reason why is because we have words that mean lots of different things, the same word. It depends on the inflection in your voice. It depends on the context that you say it in. It depends on the expression on your face. Uh, all kinds of things. I, I, I love uh, my wife. I love ice cream. Uh, I love my children. I love pizza. You know, I mean, love, same word, and you all understand that those are all different types of love, right? Because you understand our language. That's why, the God, that's why God didn't inspire the word in the English language, because it's really very, it's very poor in that, in that aspect. The Greek language, however, is not poor. The Greeks have four different words for love, depending on what kind of love it is. One is agape, which you've heard many times. It means uh, God's love. It means uh, no limit love. It means uh, completely... Uh, completely loving anybody without conditions is unconditional love. And then you have phileo, which is loving you like a brother loves you, which we have cities in our country named Philadelphia, and they are captioned the city of brotherly love from phileo and Delphi. And then you have storge, Storge means to love you like a brother, like a family kind of love. And then eros is erotic love, sexual love. By the way, that word is never used in the Bible, but it is a Greek word for the word love. So here's Jesus. Now, here's your play on words, and here's what Jesus is asking. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, 
Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me? Do you unconditionally love me more than these? Now, that little phrase, more than these, I'm really not sure what, he, what he's meaning by that because it, if you could have been there, and we've talked about this before, that I, I would have loved to have, to have been there so I could see what Jesus did when he said that more than these. Did he point, did he point at it and say more than these? Or, you know, in other words, because more than these could be, do, do, you, do you unconditionally love me more than you love, if he was pointing at the fishing nets that they all had, do you love me more than the fishing business? Could have been that. Or if he was pointing at the disciples, he could have said, do you love me more than you love these guys right here? Or he could have been talking about, do you love me more than these guys love me? So, you know, I'm not sure what he meant, but it all basically boils down to the same thing. He's asking Peter if he unconditionally loves him. Now, you remember what Peter's done, right? Peter has uh, denied him. Peter is not where he's supposed to be. He's supposed to be in Jerusalem waiting for the Holy Spirit, and he's out on the Sea of Galilee, gone back into the fishing business, and not only is he there, he's taken some of the men with him and chucked it all as a bad idea. So when, he, when, Jesus, when Peter hears Jesus say, do you agape me, Peter can't say that he agapes him. It's like, if I unconditionally loved you, I wouldn't have denied you three times, right? If I unconditionally loved you, I wouldn't be out here on a fishing boat. I'd be sitting in an upper room in Jerusalem waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. So Jesus, I can't say to you that I agape you. So he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. I love you like a brother. God says to you unconditionally, he says, well, I can't say that but I can say I love you like a brother. Verse 16, he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. And he said, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you even phileo me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, now look at his answer, you know all things. What had, what, what had happened to Peter by this point in the conversation? I think, Peter had lear- I think Peter learned not to brag, right? I mean, it learned, uh, Peter, do you even, you agape me, I phileo you, I can't say that I love you unconditionally. And then Jesus says, do you even phileo me? Do you even love me like a brother? And Peter said, Lord, I'm just gonna have to, I'm gonna have to lay this on divine omniscience. And I'm gonna have to say, I don't know whether I love you or not, but you know everything. So you tell me, do I love you? And Jesus said, feed my sheep. You know, ideas are wonderful things. I think God celebrates ideas. As a matter of fact, God gives us great ideas. We're sitting in a great building and and comfortable because somebody had an idea. The lights are on, cameras are going, sound is all, and we're comfortable. Uh, Some of you may be a little bit cold. Uh, I don't know if you are, (laughs) if you are. (laughs) I, I would turn it off, but I'll have to disappear. But anyway, We're here because somebody had an idea. Thank the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. We're all dressed differently and so forth because somebody had an idea about garments and colors and all of these kind of things. So ideas are wonderful, but we are not following an idea. We're we're following Jesus. And you might say, what's the difference? Well, Let's suppose that someone came into this building or someone started watching this morning and I'm preaching a message about like this and I'm trying to be encouraging to you about, about Christ or about forgiveness or about mercy or about, about love and all of a sudden when they come in this building, it dawns on them. Well, you know, I, have a, I really have a great portfolio. 
I, have, I, I, really, I really have a, a tremendous success pathway going here, and I have a plan, and I have my education behind me, and I, it, it, it just dawned on me that, that I need to be concerned about one other thing. I need spirituality. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what I need. So I'm going to add Jesus to my portfolio, and then I'll be a, a, a well-rounded citizen a poised for super success. Jesus will be my partner. God will be my co-pilot, which God's never co-pilot, by the way. And together, we'll build a business, and Jesus will help me, and it'll be incredible, and it'll be successful because Jesus is in it with me, and I need to add Jesus to my portfolio. Now, what has just happened there is that Jesus has become a means to fulfill an idea. But we're not following an idea we're following a person. And as a matter of fact, what I have found is that Jesus often frustrates our ideas in order to prove to us that we're following a person and not some kind of idea. The trouble with God, you know what the trouble with God is? He acts like God. And, 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 and with that in thought in mind, let's leave the second observation. Here it is. We're following a person with a strong will. We're not only following a person, we're following a person with a strong will. Look at, look at verse 18. Most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wanted, but when you are old, you'll stretch out your hands and another will gird you and they'll carry you where you don't want to go. Thus he spoke, signifying by what death he might glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said, all right, follow me. Are you ever in the presence of a strong-willed person? How many of you have a strong-willed person in your life? I, I married a strong-willed person. Look at her. She raised her hand. How did... I live with a <laughs> you are a strong-willed person. I know it. But, you know, uh, Tanya, and she gave it to both of our children, too. I don't know if you've noticed that. But they're, they're both of that way. I, this, this was so funny the other day. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but John, of course, John and Justin do most of, they do almost all of the singing. And so they occasionally mention to Tanya a song that they've heard that they think would be good for, for the band to do and to lead us in. And um, so they mention every once in a while, they'll say, hey, uh, Pastor Tanya, I heard so-and-so. Uh, do you think we might could do that? And I heard John say that, it was several weeks ago, John said that to, to Tanya, and Justin stand over here, and Justin said, John, don't waste your time. He said, he said talking to her is like dealing with the government. <laughs> That's what he said. he said. And it gave me a little flashback to the, if anybody, if you know anyone that's ever applied for disability, um, I, I guarantee you there is someone in the government that has a desk and every first application for disability, no matter, I mean, the person can be blind in both eyes, not have any arms or legs, uh, you know, they could be, it doesn't matter what kind of disabilities they have, it's going to that desk first, and the first thing that's going to be stamped is denied. You know, that's what it made me think. That, you know, don't waste your time talking to her. She's like the government, you know. <laughs> She's going to do whatever she wants to, and you may not ever even hear back whether you, she liked it or not. But anyway, strong, what, what a strong will means? It means that we want our own way, right? Well, Jesus is, is very strong will. Jesus wants his way in our life. And the great thing is that his way is always perfect. Because God is love, he will never desire for us anything that is not the best. Now think about that. If God desires something for us because he loves us, he would never desire something for us that wasn't the best for us. And because God is omniscient, which means he knows everything, that means God is never going to desire anything or offer anything to us that is second best. 
It's always going to be the best. How many of you have ever had a conversation with God and God says, all right, I have something for you to do and here's what I want you to do. But if you don't want to do that, uh, you can choose this one or this one. Ever had a conversation with God like that? No, and you're not going to have one. You know why? Because he doesn't offer you anything but the best because he loves you and his way is always perfect. He knows everything. So, so we all have plans for our lives. And, and, and we, we, we basically go to God and say, God, I can't wait to show you my plan. Oh, this is the most amazing plan that you have ever seen in your life. How many of you have ever seen the refrigerator motto that says, if you want to see God laugh, show him your plan, right? But we, we still do, even though we know that. And, and, and it's like, all right, God, I'm, all right, listen, I'm just going to write this out. Here's what I've been thinking. I want, I'm going to show you in a minute. This, this is just the most amazing thing. Look, I'm going, to go through my, I'm going to go through my 20s and my 30s and my 40s and my 50s, and then I'm going to retire when I'm 62, isn't that a great plan? I mean, wow, God, that's amazing. Look, just look at, just look at this. And then we go to the big reveal, and uh, okay, God, here's my plan. Uh, check it out. Um, are, are are you amazed? Uh, what? Uh, what what do you mean? No. You oh you have a you have a plan for my life. This this is not it. This is a great plan, God. This is wonderful. Well, here's the truth about all of that. I don't know about you, but I want to walk with Jesus because Jesus' ways are always right. So if I walk with him, I get the plan that God has for my life. I don't want to follow some pseudo-spiritual version of myself and what plans I might cook up in life. So if I'm going to follow Jesus, I'm following a person, not an idea. That person is strong-willed, and I'm going to have to submit to his will. And here's the third observation. We're all following the same person, but we're not all following the same path. In Verse 20, then Peter turning around saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following who had leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter seeing him said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if I will that he remains till I come, what is that to you? Follow me. Do you know how John begins his gospel? Matthew begins with the, with the chronology of Jesus. Matthew was written by a tax collector who's very tedious. And the gospel was written to show the Jews that Jesus is the king of the Jews. Therefore, a king needs a lineage. It begins with a lineage. Goes all the way back to David. And then Mark was written to show that Jesus was the suffering servant. A servant doesn't need a genealogy, so it doesn't begin with one. It just begins with Jesus being a servant of people. Luke is written to the Greek mind to show that Jesus is the perfect man. A perfect man needs a genealogy, and so Luke includes a genealogy. And he shows in his gospel how Jesus is the perfect man. John goes all the way back to the beginning. And he says in the first verse, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God, and without him nothing was made that was made. And down it goes on down into verse 14, and it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we're all following the same Word. We're all following the same truth. We're all following the same Savior. But we're not all following the same 
path. You know that you're getting off track in following Jesus when you start focusing on your path or someone else's path and you stop focusing on the one that you say that you are following. We're all following the same person, but we're not following the same path. And it's challenging to embrace the path that God has chosen for you. It's so easy to get tunnel vision and focus everything through yourself. You gotta come to my church. It's all about my prayer group. It's all about, about my, uh, my life group. And, and, and you just get to focusing on the fact that where you are is, is the best. And forget about the fact that God has a path for each of us. That we are not the end of every path. Everybody doesn't follow the same path that we follow. We're, we're just part of the tapestry of the kingdom of God. And God, this, this world is a dark place. And God has light for every dark place in this world. And he's given, uh, he's given us gifts. He's given us ability. He's given us personalities. And we have all these different anointings and abilities and personalities so that God can use us to shine where he wants us to shine in this world. I mean, take Tanya and I for an example. We, first time we were in Gulfport was 35 years ago. We, at 35 years ago, uh, we left Gulfport and we went to Meridian, and, and when we left Gulfport, we said, we will never be back again. And I said, we will never be back here again. We were in Meridian 14 years, and all of a sudden, the Spirit of God began to move on us, and now we have been back here for 22 years. What happened? Just what I've been preaching to you. We had to focus on a person and not a path. If we could plan our own path, we would have planned not to venture this way again. Nothing personal now, we didn't even know you guys. It was just a very tough time. But our path would have determined, no, we're not going there. But because we don't follow a path, we follow a person, we, ha we, we heard Jesus saying to us, it, here's where you must go. Now, isn't, isn't that what Jesus is saying to Peter? Peter, you follow me. It doesn't matter what I ask John to do. You follow me. I'm, talking, I'm asking you. So the path that we follow, the reason it's so difficult to follow our path is because the path that we follow is not a perfect path, path because we don't always hear God when God speaks to us. And, we, and, and, and no one is guaranteed a perfect path. And my job as your pastor is not to get you to follow the path that I think that you need to follow the path. You know, everybody, and, and this is something that I went through early in the ministry, when you're a pastor, you want everybody to come to your church, the church that you pastor. And you can't understand why anyone would ever leave the church, the wonderful church that you pastor, to go somewhere else. And you will do your very best to try to either talk or intimidate or whatever you need to do these people into not choosing another path, so to speak. Because you don't understand that everything about people's lives is directed by the Lord, our Christian life, and that he has a path for each of us to go. And it might not be this path. God might have a, a different direction to, to lead us in. And if we do, our job is to, is to hear God, to guide you to see God and to know God and to hear God and walk the path that God has designed for you. Listen to, listen to how the gospel ends. This is, I, I love this last verse. Verse 25, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. What'd you say, John? <laughs> yeah. 33 years that Jesus walked on this earth 
And in 33 short years that Jesus walked on this earth, John saying he was so overwhelming that if all the things that he did while he was here on earth were written down, the world could not hold all of the volumes that could be written. So John, what are you claiming about Jesus? Are you claiming that, that he is so wonderful and beautiful and exhaustible and extraordinary that all the world couldn't contain the information that was written about Jesus? Yeah, I think that's what he's claiming. I mean, do you, do you see what John's doing? John's inviting us. This is an invitation verse. This verse is basically saying to us, you can follow the one who is so unexplainable, so inexhaustible, so wonderful in his life that the world could not hold the volumes that would be written about him. Or you can follow your small plan, your, your small security, your, your small comfort. So which will it be? John is saying, look, I'm inviting you to lean into the most electrifying person that has ever existed on this earth. And no other person can make this claim. I can't make this claim. You can't make this claim. As a matter of fact, you could take all 65 years of my life and probably put it in one comic book, you know, if you wanted to. But we have been invited to follow a person that is so outstanding that the world itself could not contain him. And that's what John is saying. And here's what I've learned in life about this. If, if you focus on when, where, why, and even how, this life for you is going to be frustrating and confusing. But if you'll change your focus from when, where, why, and how to who, life gets much simpler. The who is Jesus, and we follow Christ, not an idea. And the trouble with God is that he acts like God, and he expects us to follow him. All right, let's bow our head just one moment.